Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is an author that is believed to have written a book known as The Woman in the Alabaster Jar, which simply stated is the one that is was the big influence under the Da Vinci Code, which became a major motion picture, exploring the possibility that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were actually in union as marriage. And our guest today is a Roman Catholic scholar, and she's also a former university professor, and she's going to join us today to talk about this interesting aspect, the fact that everybody seems to want to refute the fact that there was possibly a relationship between these two, and in fact that there probably was. And I'd like to welcome our guest today, Margaret Starbird, to the Beyond 50 radio program to talk about this wonderful story. And Margaret, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Thanks, Daniel. I'm happy to be able to be here. Now, i got to be honest with you. When I was watching the movie, I found it kind of hokey, and I didn't take the opportunity to read the book itself. Mm -hmm. And I had that opportunity, actually, when I was on public broadcasting, and I didn't realize that it was going to be such a big deal. Let's talk a little bit about this and why it created such a stir. Interestingly enough, I think if Dan Brown had written that book 10 years earlier, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. (laughs) By the time he wrote it, the Catholic Church had managed to implode their credibility over a number of issues, including scandals of pedophilia and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. And so people were suddenly able to say to themselves, well, what else do they forget to tell us? (laughs) <laughs> and at that point, this book started. It hit the scene. My book was written, you know, the Alabaster Jar book that you cited a minute ago, was written in 1990 and published in 93. Mm-hmm. And when I offered it to the publishers at Barron Company, they wrote back and said, "This we've been looking all over the world for this book." So I knew that it was good timing for them. And I, what I didn't know is that one of their sons had known kids in his. Um, catechism class who had been molested by a priest in their community down in Santa Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reasons, they were willing to hear what I had to say. And then uh, who knew, you know, that Dan Brown would be sitting on an airplane next to someone who was reading my book one day and asked, you know, kind of looked over her shoulder and said, well, what's that you're reading? And so she showed him my Alabaster Jar book. And he was, of course, interested in medieval art because his wife was an art history person. And um, other other interesting sidelines, and so when he got this book in his hands, I guess it kind of burned a hole in his pocket, in his you know like a hot potato or something. Mm-hmm. So he went home and went to research it, and about that time I had just written my second book, The Goddess in the Gospel. So he was able to get both those books, and he cited both of them in his Da Vinci Code. He actually wrote the titles into the story. Now, you know, I see here uh, by visiting your website uh, that you have actually written several books that seem to be really centered around Mary Magdalene herself. So I can see that you're very passionate about who this person was. So tell us about her and what the draw was for you to explore who Mary was. Well, as for the draw, I was part of a charismatic Catholic community, um, officially consecrated for the purpose of praying for the church because we knew it needed healing, but we didn't know what was wrong Mm -hmm. back in the 70s. And we were shown that there was something uh, almost on the par of a design flaw, if you will, in the foundations of the Christian story. We didn't know what it was, but we knew something was missing because that was what we were shown in prayer. So we decided to just keep praying about it and hope that somehow it would be revealed. So when I read in God's, in um, I'm sorry, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, in about 1970, it came out in 83, I think I read it in 85, it suddenly hit me that what we were being shown was that that this lost piece was actually the lost bride, mm-hmm. and that what we had in Christianity had been a mother and son paradigm, but we didn't have a true partnership. A mother and son is not a true partnership. And so when we lost the bride, we lost the partner. So I went back to scripture then, and I prayed over it as I went and and studied it and went back to divinity school to be sure I was getting it right, studied studied all the scriptures I could and realized that the story actually, the gospel story actually includes the bride, but she's later sent away and, and the church called her a prostitute. So after that, we couldn't find her anymore. It's like they stole her voice when they defamed her. And as I began to realize this, I realized how passionately I cared about getting back this balance that's inherent in the Gospels of the bride and bridegroom. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, it goes all the way back to ancient cults of the goddess um, 
and and actually celebrating the life force in the springtime. They had this what they call the uh, lit- liturgies or the mythologies of God and goddess couples mm-hmm. celebrated in fertility rites in the spring from ancient times, from Neolithic times. We have records of, of poetry honoring the god and the goddess in the springtime and the renewal of life in the northern hemisphere. So when you go back to those ancient lit- litur- liturgies and prayers, you find that, that they were um, celebrating the cult. They call it the cult of sacred union. But what happened was the bride anointed her bridegroom. Then they went into the bridal chamber and celebrated their their union in their nuptial bed. And when they came out, everyone in the nation celebrated with them, and their joy from the bridal chamber spread into the crops and herds and into the domain, just like Cinderella. You know, it's like everybody lives happily ever after. And so this was a yearly liturgy in the ancient world. And then later, after the sacred marriage, the bridegroom is arrested. He's tortured, mutilated, executed, and laid in the tomb. And on the third day, his bride and her entourage of maidens comes to the garden to mourn him, and find him. They find him resurrected in the garden, and the bride and the bridegroom are reunited. And I scratched my head when I read this, and I said, "My goodness, this is exactly what happens in the gospel. We just fail to recognize it, and we were always told that, oh yes, all that other stuff is pagan. It has nothing to do with us. We're Christian." So we were never encouraged to look at the ancient pagan rites and the liturgies and stories that that actually are renewed in the gospel. It was, an, it was an interesting journey finding all this out and then and then writing it up in my book. I never expected to have the book published. I just was writing it for my own benefit mostly. Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine encouraged me to get it edited and send it to um, Barron Company. And when I did, they called me back and said, oh, we've been looking all over the world for your book. <laughs> so there it is. <laughs> it's amazing how things happen, isn't it? Yeah, you know, you know, someone, you know, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is, as you were describing what you just were uh, uh, about the sacred union, and that it seems to have been suppressed, pushed away, hidden, whatever you want to call it, why something like that would happen, because it would almost seem like this would be an important element of Christianity that might restore something about it, and exactly what would that be, and why is it important? Well, what it would be would be the partnership model Okay. life, which is, you know, there is only one model for life on our planet, and that's unit, union, right. you know, together. So what we did, though, was go on with the masculine and the celibate priesthood, which was actually made official in the 12th century. Before that, priests were allowed to marry. Most people don't even realize that. But uh, starting in the 12th century, 1149, I believe it was, they had an edict that said no priests had to be celibate from then on. So that sort of put everything in the hands of the men. And we've ended up with a culture in the Western world that has had male preferences for all this time, two millennia, Mm -hmm. based on Catholic doctrine. Christian doctrine. Even though after Martin Luther we had many denominations of Christianity, we still have the same fundamentals, which is, oh yes, we have this celibate God and his mother as our paradigm for holiness. Uh, so what would change is that you would have a partnership. And actually, you know, what's interesting, I, when, I first read, when I first wrote my Alabaster Jar book, I also wrote a story, just so people would know how it could have happened that we would lose this bride. The story is actually published in the beginning of my Alabaster Jar book. It's about 20 pages, and it's fiction. But it's the story of how it might have happened. And in that story, um, Jesus is already gone, and Joseph comes to Mary and says, I have to get you out of town. And then she obediently follows him into the desert, and they go off to a place of safety because uh, uh, Jesus' family is all afraid that the Romans are going to come get her, not on the day of the crucifixion, but on the day of the resurrection. Suddenly this rumor has gone all over the city of Jerusalem that Christ is risen. This is Jesus is risen just like Tammuz, the god of the springtime that rises from the dead. And so they style him as a god. And of course, the Romans thought they had a dead insurrectionist. And instead, they've got rumors of a risen god on their hands. So of course, the family would have been frantic to get her out of town, especially if she was pregnant. Anyway, that's my story. I sent it. I sent this story along with um, my manuscript, and it got published in the Alabaster Jar book. But I gave the story to my priest before I had it published, before I even offered it for publication. And when he gave it back to me, he said, this could heal the church. He thought it was a gift. 
And I think it's a gift too, but unfortunately, because the establishment is so slow to recognize gifts often, they've come out and said, oh, no, it can't be true. It's not what we teach. Well, (laughs) maybe it should be is my role to show them how they could benefit from reclaiming the bride and going back to the roots of Christianity and saying, look, this is how we lost her. We were trying to save her from the Romans, and we took her to a place of safety, and we hid her too well. Mm -hmm. And by the time her story surfaces in the Middle Ages, it's heresy. And so they go after it again. In the 13th century, they go after the heresy of the Grail, and they and they lose her again because they repressed the story. Until now, uh, actually in this 20th century, it surfaced again in Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Probably you know the title of that book. Um, that's another one that Dan Brown read after. I think he read it after he read Alabaster Jar. He went back to my source, which was Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And I, you know, I hadn't wanted to read that book. It was, it looked like blasphemy. When I read the back cover, it said Jesus was probably married. I almost dropped that book. I couldn't get out of the library <laughs> fast enough. I uh-huh. wanted nothing to do with it. And then I started praying about it. I said, well, maybe this is what I need to know. And so I went back there. And two years later, I finally had the courage to read the thing. And I, and I was devastated at first. And I had a, a really close friend in my community that I told you that, um, that had originally been shown that there was something missing. I had her pray with me over it, and we had a bunch of interesting experiences. Most of most of my story of how I stumbled into this and how I just, it's almost like the Parsifal story where, the, you know, the poor fool <laughs> stumbles into things and then suddenly this is revealed or that is revealed mm-hmm. in my synchronicity. So eventually, um, this friend of mine and I decided that it was time to publish it, but it took us three or four years to go through all of the process, and that book, it's called The Goddess in the Gospel, and that was the second book I wrote, and it's also one that Don, Dan Brown read before he read, uh, wrote his um, Da Vinci Code. And I think it was what convinced him that I was actually on the right track, because those, some of those stories, I mean, they're stranger than fiction, <laughs> but they actually happened. Sometimes life is that way, isn't it? <laughs> it's wonderful. It's just mm-hmm. such an amazing journey, isn't it? I mean, you know, I was thinking. Uh, for those of you just joining us, we're talking with Margaret Starbird. Uh, she's the author of the Woman in the Alabaster Jar, that uh, was the influence of Dan Brown's uh, The Da Vinci Code to explore the possibility, or perhaps the reality, that uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene were actually in union, which can actually restoring change, I suppose, the way that the Christian doctrine is being uh, taught. Now, it's interesting, Margaret, as you're talking about this, that uh, I've had uh, been to certain Christian churches, and from time to time you listen to Christian radio, and you listen to people speaking the gospel, if you will. And over the many years, it was always something puzzling to me, and it seems that you've really surfaced what that is and what bothered me in some elements about the Christian religion, and that is that I always felt they were hiding or holding something back, but I couldn't put my finger on it because I really didn't know the Christian Gospels, if you will, as well. You know, simply you can look in the Bible and read for yourself. But it seems to me that that could be an element that would heal the Christian church by saying you don't have to worry about hiding things anymore. You can actually just really speak the truth now. Right. Well... That's the way I felt about it. I thought, what what good is a faith that isn't true? Mm-hmm. And so if there is truth in what I'm saying, one of the things I studied when I went back to look at all these things in depth, um, not just praying about them. I, when I prayed, I got positive answers, but I still needed to support it from the academic side. So mm-hmm. I went back to a divinity school and studied in the divinity library and looked up all these things in great tomes that are all dusty from sitting on the shelf. And one of the things I discovered was a wonderful book called Was Jesus Married? It was written in the early 70s by a Dr. William E. Phipps, who is a Protestant clergyman, actually, and he was the head of the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Davis and Elkins College in West Virginia for many years. He's now retired. But he wrote a lot of amazing books, and what he did was to go back to Judaism and mm-hmm. study the first century Judaism and the customs of the time, and he found that everyone, every male in Judaism was married. There were very, I mean, there was, it was impossible not to be. It was incumbent on a father to find a bride for his son before his 18th birthday. And if the, if the son was to be a rabbi and was studying, then he had until his 20th birthday to marry. But, but it was uh, what we call a, a cultural imperative 
that all sons be married. And, of course, it goes back to the first uh, book of the Bible where in Genesis God says, be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, and, and well, first before that he even says, it's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a partner for him. Mm -hmm. And so he creates Eve. Well, the Jewish people took that very seriously, and marriage was at the very heart of their community. And, of course, every Jewish father knew that if he had unmarried sons, he was going to have unmarried daughters at the same rate. Because, <laughs> and nobody wants those. Because no, there's a, there's certainly not. Of, so. What are you going to get out of the house? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So so they, they took it very seriously because they didn't want their un, unmarried daughters to be a burden to their family. Mm -hmm. So in any case, um, it, it was... This Dr. William E. Phipps, who went and looked through all the sociology of Judaism and discovered that there was just oh no way Jesus could have avoided been being married, and if he had, the, that's the first thing the Pharisees would have called him on because he would have been breaking the law. Mm. And they never mentioned, of course, anything. And then, of course, the other thing I found was if you go through Paul's letters, you find Paul talking about Jesus. And then he says, now, as for marriage, it doesn't matter anymore because the kingdom of God is going to happen any minute now, and we're all going to be rescued from this world that we live in. So don't even bother to get married if you're not married. And then he says, look at me. He doesn't say, look at Jesus for his example for the celibate life. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you suppose if he had been trying to convince them that, that this was the mode that Jesus wanted for them, he would have used Jesus as the example if he could have. Now, it's my understanding, too, though, didn't the Apostle Paul really hate women in the first place? Well, we don't know that he did. Okay. We just know that he. Uh, a lot of the letters that are attributed to Paul, they have discovered in the last 40 years with doing linguistic studies that those aren't really written by Paul. Okay. So where it says, I don't allow women to teach or have authority over men, um, that's actually in Second Timothy, I think. He's Paul is not... That's not really written by Paul. It was written by a disciple of Paul. So we're not really sure. But the point the point is that the whole society was misogynist at that point. So it wasn't just Paul. It was everybody. It was, I think Christianity was a radical movement because it did listen to the voices of the women and allowed the women to travel with their husbands. And, in fact, Paul mentions that also in one of his letters. He says, the brothers of Jesus, Peter, and the other apostles are all traveling around with their wives. Uh, that's a surprise. Mm -hmm. But they're actually traveling as missionary couples in that time. And Paul is the first witness to the practice of the Christians. So he must have been seeing something that was radically different from what people would have expected at that time and place. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, too, Margaret, that uh, many years ago as I decided to invoke on a my spiritual practice uh, through Eastern meditations, mm -hmm. that uh, I at first had a really bad taste for the Christian religion, but then I came through the back door of it and I thought, well, wait a minute, this is a lot different than, you know, my experience with it on this side, and why isn't this being taught? You know, and it That's didn't make right. any sense to me. You know, and then, you know, when you see this uh, shake-up of, of the foundation, so to speak, that's kind of saying, wait a minute, let's get back to what it possibly really was, the idea that Jesus was married to a woman, you know, Mary Magdalene, and this brings the feminine back into Christianity, that it doesn't seem so black and white that there actually is compassion, that there actually is forgiveness and faith and things that really belong in any kind of religion that helps us to answer the question, who are we in this world? And you can see, you know, that sometimes as you have raised these questions and explored these things, that uh, especially when it comes to the myth, mythos of the thing, that, uh, you know, that I might be interested to find out what were some of the other myths of the bride as well, you know, being in exile. Well, of course, there are many bride in exile myths and stories, and we, we find them in our Christian fairy tales, mm -hmm. our our midi our European fairy tales that we have, they, don't, they aren't explicitly Christian, they're folk tales. But, but what I want to do is go back to a book. I love this book by Peter Kingsley. Are you aware of Peter Kingsley's work? Not he, Peter Kingsley, no. He wrote a book called In the Dark Places of Wisdom. And in that book, he actually cites the time and place when the feminine, the Sophia, you know, the feminine wisdom of God was denigrated. It was actually in the time of Plato, and Plato and his friends decided to become lovers of logos, of logic and reason, and to abandon the feminine ways of knowing and being through meditation and incubation. In the ancient times, they had shamanic 
prophets who would who would um, cultivate the inner life through meditation and incubation, and those practices were abandoned from the time of Plato. And I think Jesus was trying to bring them back and bring back the the honoring of the feminine at the same time. And that and that because Jesus keeps saying, "Go into your own closet and pray alone." Not this big synagogue thing, but go back to your, you know, to your inner, uh, inner practice. Right. Those are the kinds of things that are ignored in Christianity a lot. But, but those are the kinds of things he was saying to his apostles. So we we have this um, kind of a split between the Jesus of the gospel and the Christ that we ended up with in the church. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, you know, in, as the religion as opposed to the spirituality of Christianity. So um, anyway, so but Peter Kingsley's book then cites the time when these philosophers who were lovers of Sophia, that's what philosopher means, lovers of Sophia became lovers of Logos instead. And they denigrated and abandoned the Sophia. And so she becomes the bride in exile. She's lost to consciousness. They're not cultivating the wisdom, the body wisdom, the unconscious, the inner, um, the inner path anymore. It's all externals. And about that time Zeus starts cheating on Hera in the Greek pantheon, you know. It's it's not a partnership anymore. And mm-hmm. it's like left hand and right hand lose their connection. And they go on with the right handedness and leave the left handedness behind. Interesting. Huh? Yeah, certain hypocrisies are certainly interesting, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now what do you think it is about Mary Magdalene that sort of perhaps has grabbed us the way it has at this time. Well, I think it's a matter of chivalry, for one thing. Mm-hmm. To, a write, to write her off, call her a prostitute, and leave her prostrate on the ground and abandon her and then go off with this whole other show, if you will, was, if, if anything, it was unchivalrous. And it was also a lie. So to correct the record, you know, it, it's funny, you know, I, I just kept thinking to myself, we expected the priest to tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And so when I read a book, uh, right just before I read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, I was told by a friend who was my walking partner that I should read a book called In God's Name. And in that book, the author, David Yollop, talks about the Vatican Bank scandal and the untimely death of Pope John Paul I. Do you remember the pope that had the 33-day reign back in 1978? Oh, Yes. Uh-huh. And how shocked we were to wake up one morning and find out he was already dead when he had just been uh, Yeah, he was poisoned, to... wasn't he? Well, apparently. Yes. But but no one knows for sure because they didn't do an autopsy. They just shoveled him into a grave without an autopsy. So no one knows exactly. They just said he died of an overdose of his medicine or something. Ah. And then they got rid of him that way. But the point was that that day he had planned to have a meeting to open up the Vatican Bank scandal to the authorities in Rome who were interested in getting to the bottom of the money laundering that was going on. And I guess the the powers that be in the Vatican didn't want to risk having the Vatican lose face over this, and so they decided to, to get rid of him instead. But I was so shocked when I read that book, and I thought, my gosh, they don't even believe in the God that, that they say they believe in if they're able to kill the Pope, the Vicar of Christ. What are they doing here? You know, <laughs> yeah. I was just like horrified. <laughs> so I thought, after I thought, read that book, I said, well, nothing could disturb me more than this. So I took that book back to the library and I checked out Holy Blood, Holy Grail mm-hmm. on the same day. And I, I didn't realize it at the time that I was actually setting my feet on a path that was going to take me all the way through this journey, trying to rediscover and reclaim the role of Mary Magdalene at the side of Christ. I you know I picture them holding hands in the garden after dinner, <laughs> as as any couple would, and there's nothing there's nothing anti-Christian about that. In fact, they would be a beautiful model for a marriage in the Christian family and in the Christian doctrines. But instead, they wrote they wrote her out, and then when the time came and they needed a feminine because the people were demanding a mother, they said, oh well, fine, we'll put the mother of Jesus in this role, and so they heaped all the all the robes of Magdalene on top of the roles that the mother would have worn anyway. And so poor Virgin Mary has all these roles that don't belong to her in addition to her own. And throughout the centuries, we've had this paradigm then of a celibate son and a virgin mother as our model for holiness. And what we end up with 
is actually a, an imbalance. And if you ask any, well, look at the divorce rate. I mean, you can tell that there's something wrong. Because of course. People, yeah, there's something at the core of our faith that's not holding up under these stresses that we have. And I believe it's partly because the paradigm was broken. The paradigm of partnership was broken in the cradle of Christianity. I think one of the most interesting moments in our times when it comes to the idea of religion, especially as you were talking about the Vatican and and this money laundering scandal that was going on, and you see a lot of in the Catholic Church the surfacing of priests who are basically having sexual relationships with boys, and it goes on and on, and it's almost like there is a cleansing, if you will, that the truth is really surfacing, and there's no way to avoid that, because the truth always comes through one way or the other. That maybe it's a way for these, I guess if you will call them, religious scholars who are teaching what God's Word is to say, you know, it's time to not only start telling the truth even by sharing your own vulnerability, but the fact is, is this is the only way that we can actually move forward into the next spiritual step. Right. It definitely needs to be purified. It reminds me of the scripture where Jesus castigates the Pharisees and said, you know, you're looking like you're whitewashed sepulchers, but inside it's only worms. And that's what I felt when I read in God's name. I said, my gosh, this is a can of worms. It really is. <laughs> it's time to open it up. Well, you know, I, I mentioned when we first started talking that I belong to a charismatic prayer group. There were actually eight of us. There were two priests and five women and the husband of one of the women, so a total of eight. And we were consecrated in 1979 at an official mass, a home mass, but we had an outside priest come and consecrated us as a group for the intention of offering our lives for the purification of the Roman Catholic Church and its priesthood. Mm -hmm. That was our intention. And now to figure out that what was causing all their problems actually related to their denial of the feminine. Because in denying the feminine and their relationship with the feminine, they went off on all these wrong tracks about power and money and and deviant sex. It's Mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just the obvious... um, result of the loss of the bride. So it's all interrelated. <laughs> I'll tell you, Margaret Starbird, it's a pleasure to talk with someone like you who's really, as you said, opening up this can of worms or one of the uh, people who are actually getting it moving in that direction. Because when you think about uh, God itself, the idea of God is love, but then God becomes interpreted through the human experience, but only halfway, if you will then you can realize the reason that people seem to have so much fear in this world and why peace seems to be almost that impossible dream that's becoming more and more real as this cleansing as you're talking about occurs. You can see why that's so vital. Right. You know, it's, um, well, one of the most interesting revelations I've received recently was when someone showed me the picture of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, Michelangelo's painting of the creation, and under God's left arm is this lovely female figure who is the Sophia. So Michelangelo must have known about her. But in the (laughs) beginning, in the Old Testament, in the the book of Proverbs, and again in the book of Sirach, uh, Ecclesiasticus, it talks about the Sophia and how she's God's delight. And she... Uh, covers the earth like a mist, and so like she's the wisdom and the holiness of God in the spiritual presence of the feminine. Mm-hmm. And so Michelangelo <clears throat> paints her right there on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the creation, where God is reaching out His hand to touch Adam, and under His left arm He's got the Sophia tucked in there. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and so there is a partnership already in Christianity at the foundation. God and His wisdom are are this, but. But to personify them in human terms, you see, that's a mistake because God isn't really a male. God is a spirit. God is pure mm-hmm. energy, if you will. Mm-hmm. God is a verb. Some people say God is a verb. But the Pope stood under that painting in the Sistine Chapel and gave a speech in 1999 on Easter Day. And he said, you know, this painting of God isn't really God. <laughs> and I thought, no, it really isn't. It's not really God. That God is beyond all comprehension of God and and just to narrow it and say oh yes he's male and he looks like Santa Claus except a little bit unfriendly up here with his <laughs> angry eyes and you know it's diff- it's just not really God 
Mm-hmm. Well, then I read this book uh, came out, I guess, in, in 2008, a wonderful, interesting book by a rabbi and his friend. I think I can't remember their names right now, but um, it's called The Sistine Secrets. And interestingly enough, they cite some of the same painters that I cite in my Alabaster Jar book as having known about the heresy of the grail and and painting secret symbols into their paintings to let to tip us off it's almost like using morse code right. what they do is to use they use symbols that everyone can pick up on and then later it reveals what they were really thinking mm-hmm. and apparently the whole ceiling of the Sistine Chapel Michael Angelo was so angry with the pope for forcing him to do this huge painting that took 10 years of his life or something lying on his back painting this stuff up in the ceiling on huge scaffolding that he painted all these symbols into the paintings that are derogatory to the Vatican and to the position. And in fact, there's not one Christian saint on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's all um, sibyls, the prophetesses of the pagan world and Old Testament prophets. No Christians, no Jesus, no Mary, no no anybody, just Old Testament and pagan. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, it's always interesting when you get the possibility to explore what's in the closet and kind of let it open, and it seems our artists, and even our musicians, if you will, find ways to say, you can't suppress the truth because it's going to get out one way or the other, so come clean, maybe admit that you've made a mistake and how you've translated this language to whoever you're translating it to, and show your human side, and let's just move forward from there, because again, as you hide then you begin to sprout fear, and fear obviously sprouts violence, and that's totally opposite of what I believe God as Spirit is teaching, is that, no, you need to be here in love and in union, uh, because that's what all of this is for, so that we can enjoy it, more or less, if, if you will. And, you know, it's wonderful. Do you have any projects that you're uh, currently working on that are coming to the surface uh, that continues on the story about Mary? Because I can say you've written several books, so this is something you really you got a hold of and you're enjoying. Well, Someone asked me after the Da Vinci Code came out and people uh, started doing documentaries to debunk the Da Vinci Code. Mm -hmm. Someone asked me if I was going to change my tune. And I said, no, I'm going to sing it louder. (laughs) So I I wrote the book that's called Mary Magdalene Bride in Exile, Uh 2005, and published that. And in the back, it has a CD, a 60-minute audio CD uh, with my generic introduction lecture in it. So it's tucked inside the back cover of that book. So people who don't have to come find me, they can actually listen to that on their car radio or on their car mm-hmm. CD player. And that uh, that was the 2005. And then it, this year, in 2009, I published with a uh, – Joan Norton is a Jungian therapist, friend of mine from L.A. And what we did was to collaborate on a book called The 14 Steps to Awaken the Sacred Feminine. And in that book – I wrote essays about Mary Magdalene's life. The idea is to form circles of women who are willing to meditate on Magdalene's story and then see what comes up for them about their own spiritual life and their own spiritual journey. Because Mary Magdalene is actually the model for the Christian soul seeking union with Christ. She is that person in the gospel who, who represents the church and each individual as the bride of the eternal bridegroom. So we have this whole mythology, if you will, of the soul seeking union with God, and it's uh, impersonified in Christ and Magdalene. So when we read her story, then it helps us to see the light on our own journey and our own spiritual development. So anyway, we wrote this little book. It has 14 chapters, and then we also developed a Magdalene rosary to go with it. So that would be prayers honoring Magdalene's journey and the mysteries that she lived through, you know, meeting Jesus, anointing Christ at the banquet, going to, through the, uh, carrying the cross, you know, watching him die on the cross, and then later being uh, meeting him in the garden and being resu- um, united with him after his resurrection, and sent to the apostles as the first witness to the gospel that Jesus was risen. So we have um, all her story then, and then the legends of Mary Magdalene take her to France, I don't know if you're aware of that, but her story takes her away from Jerusalem to a place of hiding. And then later when her child, I believe, was born probably in Alexandria, and then later they decide to to get away from 
the Romans even further, and they go to Gaul, the other province, north, the north shores of the Mediterranean, which is now France. And the stories of Mary Magdalene there are very powerful in France. So we kind of think that, that that's where she might have gone with her child, if she had a child. That's that's the that's the hint in the story. And you know what? A lot of people have taken off with this idea that she had a child. Oh, yes, well, well there must be a bloodline, in which case I must be descended from it. Well, the fact is that bloodlines from the Middle Ages are already dissipated throughout the whole civilization. So everybody's got some of this bloodline by now. It's not about a bloodline. What it's about is the child actually proves that the marriage was at all levels. It wasn't just a spiritual union, but it was a physical union as well. So. You know, it makes me curious when you say that about the severed bloodline, about the uh, Holy Grail heresy, if you will, and how it related to the Old Testament prophecies. And that seems to be one of the centerpieces, you know, between the, I believe it's the Israelites and the Jews, about who really gets to step forward and claim this grail. Tell us about that. Well, I think the grail, I think the um, Holy Blood, Holy Grail book was on to something when they looked at the old French word for Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. And it was S-A-N-G-R-A-A-L, the Saint Graal, all one word. And the people who wrote about the Holy Grail said, oh, yes, the Grail is a chalice that once contained the blood of Christ. It's a vessel, cup, that once contained the blood of Christ. And they hypothesized that it's the, the vessel that Jesus used on at the Last Supper when he instituted the Holy Eucharist. This is my body, this is my blood. And we even have pictures in the Middle Ages of Joseph of Arimathea holding this cup under Jesus' wounds on the cross and catching his blood. So that's how literal they are about this cup catching the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that it's a cup or a vessel that once contained the blood of Christ. Well, if you take the same word, the old French word, sangral, and divide it after the G instead of after the N, you have two four-letter words, sang real. And S-A-N-G, sang, is blood. And real is royal. So instead of saying, oh, they brought this cup to the shores of France, we might have a legend that says Mary Magdalene and Joseph of Arimathea brought the blood royal, the sangral, the blood royal to the shores of France. Well, you don't carry the blood royal around in a jar with a lid. The blood royal is carried in the veins of a child. And so if that legend is read in this other way, then it says that they brought a child of this royal bloodline, the, the Davidic bloodline for whom all the promises were made, that God was going to stay with this bloodline forever. This is the bloodline that then would have been rescued and brought to the shores of France to rescue them from the Romans. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's an interesting way to look at it. So it takes away the Holy Grail thing that's hidden somewhere that nobody can get a hold of. And no it's one's ever found. Actually it. about a child, in yes, fact. And it becomes, well, it becomes a female child, in fact. And, and in... The legend, that was the funniest part. All this time I'm praying and trying to study this stuff, and I'm thinking, but they can't, I mean, they can't have hidden this story from us. You know, how could they How could they have hidden this story? And my husband at the time was a district, engin district engineer for the Corps of Engineers, an Army Corps of Engineers, down in Nashville, Tennessee. And we were invited out to dinner by people who were from France. And these people showed up, and I sat next to a woman who had, gone to every shrine of the Black Madonna throughout the whole region, and she started telling me when I asked her about the Christians on the shores of France in the first century, she just lit up like a candle, and she wanted to tell me all about Mary Magdalene and all about little <laughs> Sarah. And I said, well, who is St. Sarah? And she said, oh, she was a little girl on the boat. And I said, what? <laughs> and I went home, and I looked up Sarah's name in my concordance, and Sarah means princess in Hebrew. So they have this legend that there was a little girl on the boat whose name was Sarah, which means princess. Mm -hmm. And then they're trying to tell me that this is not Magdalene's daughter. The point is that by the time the legends are ever written, the Inquisition is already in place. Right. So there's no way they can tell the story except in symbol. Mm -hmm. And so they call the girl a servant. They say she's black and she's a servant of her relatives. The other Mary's on the boat. She's the mm -hmm. servant. That's just the story that's passed down. And I'm looking at this and saying, yes, and her name means princess. Uh huh. She's the servant, all right. Well, then I remembered all the, the folk tales 
about Cinderella and her she's black too you know she has a sooty face that's the whole idea about Cinderella she's been keeping the hearth and she's got ashes in fact the german says ashenpoodle which means ash face mhm okay so she's she's got this darkened skin as well and i thought well what is this about the dark skin so one day i'm praying with my bible and i said okay lord show me something i need to know today and i opened my bible to a very obscure passage in the book of lamentations and it says the princes of judah whose faces were once white as milk, are now black as soot. They are not recognized in the streets. And I thought, oh my gosh, blackness and having faces as black as soot is a sign of the Davidic bloodline in exile. They are not recognized in the streets because they've been deposed and they've been sent away as refugees to a foreign land. And no one even knows their name. They're kind of like the janitor in your local school whose name you couldn't even pronounce if you tried because he's from some other country and he may be a tribal leader in some other place, but here we don't even know his name. Wow. And he's on the late shift, right? So, but that's the, that was the condition of this bloodline. When they traveled from Jerusalem to Gaul and nobody knew who they were and they just tried to fit into the uh, culture there as best they could without telling anyone because they were trying to hide. They're trying to hide from the Romans, and they don't need anybody to know where they are. Mm-hmm. And then 1,200 years later, when the story surfaces in the southern part of, part of France, the Inquisition comes out with a vengeance and has the Albigensian Crusade and tries to kill them all. 109. The Albigensian, Albigensian Crusade is launched in southern France to blot out the heresy that Christ and Mary Magdalene were partners. That's, you know, it's quite incredible to to hear this story as it is, because I don't know why it is, not that I study Christianity or even religion for that matter, but I've got a good understanding of it. But it seems to me that it really adds, I guess, a lot of balance. Um, uh, It sort of centers you to hear things like this. And really, as you bring in the human conscious of common sense, you think, this just makes sense. It makes sense. That I get so many emails from people saying, thank God, this makes so much sense. It makes so much more sense than the, what they told us. Well, first of all, if you, if you know that in Judaism that there was this um, cultural compulsion to be married, mm-hmm. and to, be, to avoid being married, you would have caused all kinds of chatter. So to have all of that blotted out, it's just impossible. Mm-hmm. So you have to assume that, that maybe they just forgot to tell us. And in fact, a lot of scholars have said that uh, it's incumbent on the people who say Jesus wasn't married to somehow find evidence for that. Because just just the fact that Jesus' wife isn't married is nothing. None of the wives are ne- mentioned in the Gospels. Peter has a wife, too. We know he does. He has a mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. But his wife is never mentioned, and it's, and, his, uh, and her name is never mentioned. So, you know, it's, it's just uh, incumbent on those who believe he wasn't married to show us some evidence for that, because everyone was married in those days and in, in, in that time. So then from there, okay, so if he was married to whom? That's the question. In fact, when I started on my journey, I thought, I have three questions. Could Jesus have been married? Was he that human? And the answer I've come up with is yes, absolutely. If so, to whom? And the only candidate is the woman who meets him at the tomb. Because in the ancient rites, it was the bride who meets the bridegroom at the tomb, resurrected in the garden. So that has to be the bride. Well, in all four Gospels, that's Mary Magdalene. Mm Mm-hmm. And in fact, on every list, there are eight lists of women who traveled with Jesus, and on seven of the eight lists, Mary Magdalene is mentioned first. Not only that, but her name, her title, comes from an ancient prophecy in the book of Micah that says, To you, O Magdalater, watchtower of of the flock, to you dominion shall be restored to the daughter of Zion. Why are you crying? Have you no king? Has your counselor perished that you mourn as a woman in labor? And it goes on and talks about her having to go into foreign exile. It says, nations will defile you. They will call you unclean. In in those four lines in the book of Micah, chapter 4, you're going to find those four lines, Micah uh, 4, 8 to 11, sums up the story of Mary Magdalene, and it has the root word for her title right there in the the text. To you, O Magdal Eder. Magdal meaning tower. So her her epithet, the title that they gave her, reflects this prophecy, and it's uh, it means tower or elevated or high. 
So she's the preeminent Mary in the gospel. She has a significant title. And everyone says, oh, yeah, and she was a prostitute. And I'm saying, oh, no, she wasn't. There's no way this woman was a prostitute. That was what they did. They stole her voice. They stole her power. And when they exiled her, they exiled all the women from the story. Mm-hmm. She's just lost to the whole history of the Christian church. There's almost a little bit of humor in the idea of Mary Magdalene and people saying that she's a prostitute. Then you can say, well, that's true, but she only had one John, and his name was Jesus. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, well, so to speak. I, I don't know. That's a little bit, um, <laughs> no. let the diamond in the rough, if you will. Yeah, but I, exactly. I, just, I believe they were actually married and that this mm-hmm. child of theirs was actually their legitimate child. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, and they wouldn't have called her princess otherwise. So anyway. You know, it's just, it's so fascinating for you to come on our program and to talk about this. And the reason is, is because it makes you question why is it that the interpretation of God uh, in, in human form has chosen to suppress women and their voices so much and just keep the masculine side of things. But now you see this really tremendous uprising over the last many years where the women, you know, you have the women's movement, of course, in the United States, but it's beginning a ripple effect around the world without a doubt. And you can see where it's just going to really create tremendous balances. The truth totally surfaces. Yes, well, you know, I have a cute little line that I put on my website. Um, maybe you want to tell them my website is marketstarboard.net. Mm-hmm. But at the upper corner, I have this little um, quote that I made up for myself. It says, a heretic teaches what the church doesn't teach. Mm-hmm. A prophet teaches what the church doesn't teach yet. And I actually teach what the church taught in the beginning and has forgotten. So in a way, I'm a historian. I'm going back to the very roots, to the Gospels themselves, and I'm trying to reconstruct it to restore the bride as true partner. Because that gives us a paradigm for partnership going forward. And it's not a new paradigm, it's a very old one. And in fact, it goes all the way back to ancient times when they honored the life force as male and female. It's not just one or the other, it's both. It's union. And that's really the, going to be the thing that saves us, is finally being able to reunite the left hand and the right hand, the left brain and the right brain, and to be connected and interconnected, and to have power but also compassion, and to to bring it all back into wholeness, because what we've had now has been so out of balance for 2,000 years, and we're reaping the rewards of it. It's playing out in the desert right now. Everything's blowing up. Mm-hmm. And we want it, and then we're trying to heal it, you know. So how do you heal it? Well, this is one way you bring back the feminine. Well, I got to tell you, Margaret Starbird, it's been a pleasure to have you on the program. It certainly has my eyes uh, wide open on a lot of these things, but it's certainly at the same time kind of put pieces of the puzzle together that make a lot of sense to me. And uh, I would like you to go ahead and give your website out to people who'd be interested in finding out more about what you do and how maybe they can get involved. Okay, well, my website is www.margaretstarbird.net, and uh, you can email me right off my website. I hope some of you will go out and look for my books. They're in the libraries. You don't have to go to the store to buy them. You can find them in libraries, and um, just join, join in the celebration of the good news of the sacred union in Christianity. Mm-hmm. Well, again, thank you very much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Daniel. I hope you'll read my book. Absolutely. (laughs) They're very interesting when I'm hearing here. Like I said, years ago, I sort of had a bad taste in my mouth for the Christian religion, but then I went through the back door and I thought, now this is way different than what's being taught out there, and I found it to be very beautiful, actually. And with people like you, you know, historians going in there and, and bringing this back and piecing it together to where it makes a lot more sense than what we're being told, right. you know, is is really a, as you said, a diamond in the rough that's good for everybody. And, and we want to thank you for doing that. Thank you. You bet. I love being with you. You bet. Thank you very much. Thanks. So again, go to uh, her website, uh, and that is Mary, <clears throat> excuse me, margaretstarbird.net, and you can find out more about this interesting, compelling story. We want to thank you, the listeners, for tuning in today. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com and sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter as well as visit our blog where we post these interviews so you can listen to them at your own convenience at any time. We also have some nice YouTube streams that usually 
coincide with what, what, what we're talking about there, as well as some hot links where you can find out more about the resources that we have uh, in light of our shows as well. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You have been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway.